Thank you. Am I mic'd? You'll forgive me for using notes. Um, my memory isn't what it used to be. Uh, until this week, I was calling this the Todd Conference. But <laughs> the first TED commandment is to dream big. This isn't a story about how I found uh, a big dream and made it come true, not yet, anyway but how finding a big dream made me become more true to myself. If you want the story in emoticon form, there it is. <laughs> I've been a teacher most of my life. Thanks to many mentors and brilliant students who were my best teachers, I got good at it. My courses filled up in minutes. For over a decade, I enjoyed praise, high evaluations, and plenty of awards. It was a nice time to be my ego, but the real joy was to be of use to my students, hundreds of whom remain my friends, my advisors, and my heroes. Sometimes, uh, too often, <clears throat> I was able to help students through challenges like eating disorders, rape, stalkers, and suicide threats. But I had something to give and a way to give it. I was useful. I didn't know that for years I had also been the object of a hostile work environment and outright harassment by a few people. I had stalkers of my own, some of them threatening, but the people I asked for help just laughed. Lawyer friends told me to sue, but I didn't want to, not to this place I love. I decided to leave the job I loved and was good at, but for what? I got angry enough that when I passed a certain office, I, uh, I flipped them the bird. Actually, I, I, I covered it with my other hand, so it was more of a bird cage. <laughs> but I was, I just wanted to be useful again. As I asked the questions, I dipped into my savings, as we do. But I didn't feel poor. Ramen noodles, rice and dal, fried egg sandwiches, I liked them. I learned to make the perfect omelet. Then one day, a guy on the street asked me for a dollar and I made up an excuse. And then I walked on and I looked back and I felt relieved when he wasn't still there. And it made me think, you know, are we poor when we can't have or when we can't give? We're born with the instinct to share. <laughs> but what happens when we fear to do it? I took the advice I always gave my students. I wrote. Not in Paris. Um, this is just a photograph, I'm sorry it's so dim, of uh, one of my happiest classes and best uh, writers. I sifted my past for anything that would help me regain my self-confidence. I climbed a rock once. I played music. I did a radio show with Mahatma Gandhi's grandson, Arun. He's the Indian guy in the middle. <laughs> I swam with dolphins. I reached all the way back even to my high school science fair project. I assure you, as much as it pains you to see this, and uh, you can see I'm averting my eyes, it pains me more to show it to you. <laughs> but in my defense, I may be the only 14-year-old to have ever synthesized amino acids from the molecules of the primordial soup. And I was obviously destined to enter the fashion industry. <laughs> but looking backward didn't help. Then I found a bright spot. After a decade learning to trade the futures markets, I got good at it. I didn't typically turn 700 into 17,000, but when I looked at my numbers, I realized that my tiny account was outperforming most funds around the world. During the 2008 crash, some of us did well, and not by cheating, not with taxpayer bailouts. George Soros did 138%. Uh, some of my friends did 200%. And in my tiny account, I did 250%. It paid the bills, and it gave me something to feel confident about once again. So I spent a few days feeling like this. <laughs> and then I felt completely silly. But I didn't feel any more happy or wealthy or useful. As my confidence rose, so did commodity prices around the world. And I knew that oil isn't a free market. Gold is mined under harsh conditions. Cocoa is harvested often by children who themselves have never uh, tasted a chocolate bar. 
So when wheat prices doubled, was I profiting while someone else's child starved to death? This bothered me. I wondered how much of our economy is based simply on digging holes in the ground and then fighting wars over those holes in the ground and then constructing a system to finance the digging of those holes and the fighting of those wars while too many of us shed needless blood and tears. And if you're wondering if I chose those pictures of those traitors to reflect the three monkeys, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, I did. <coughs> there are things that need to be seen and heard and said that we are not seeing and hearing and saying. Recent weeks have been proof of this. In my spare time, which you have a lot of when you're unemployed, I studied poverty, <laughs> quite literally and figuratively, <laughs> and the value of investing in girls. This picture from the annual report of a great organization called PLAN haunted me. Maybe because of the way she's looking into the camera, maybe because I know how heavy those brass jars are, especially when they're full. Over time, hauling water four to eight hours a day instead of being in school, it will damage her growing pelvis. And she will never run or dance or give birth easily. I realize this picture is grainy. I could show you many other such photos, too many. In fact, if we had enough cameras, I could show you 100 million photos uh, just from today of girls who haul water like beasts of burden dirty water that will likely make them sick, down roads prowled by men and boys with the worst of intentions. They should be safe in school, drinking clean water and dreaming their big dreams and getting ready to give their TED Talks. A hundred million more girls never get counted at all. Sorry for the dimness of that slide. They never get counted, but they count. As a budding capitalist, I knew that anyone this strong and brave and resourceful was not a charity case to be pitied, but a great investment. And I wondered what wealth really is. Was Bernie Madoff ever really wealthy? The coat he wore on his perp walk cost about as much as this little girl, a slave in a brothel. Did capitalism have to be a system that rewards a few of us for our skill in humiliating the rest of us. I decided not necessarily. But what pissed me off most was this $1,400 wastebasket bought by Merrill Lynch's former CEO using taxpayer bailout money as part of a $1.2 million office makeover. What the hell was he throwing away? But more importantly, what are we throwing away? We're supposed to tell students, do what you love, and the money will follow and happiness will follow. But sometimes I tell students, pick a good fight and fight it with nonviolence and creativity. I needed a fight that would make me happy. Meanwhile, one summer day, I wrote down an idea to make neckties out of sari fabric, especially the gorgeous vintage fabric with the 24 karat gold brocade. And months later, I started Half the Sky by Nick Kristoff and Cheryl Woodun of the New York Times. By page 27, I thought to myself, I need to tell my old student Anoop about this. Anoop had started his NGO, Sense of Relief, an organization to help uh, fight human trafficking out of ideas that he came up with as a student. So I was on page 27. I said, I'll finish the chapter and then email him. I turned the page. And on page 29, Nick Kristoff of the New York Times was writing about Anup Patel. I thought, well, this is a small world of 7 billion people. Maybe it's trying to tell me something. 23 days later, and more such amazing coincidences later, an NGO called Destiny Reflection in Calcutta made the first prototype sari tie. They keep getting better, but our chief design officer, who's 23, wants them to be perfect. Our mission is not charity, but a luxury, handmade, one-of-a-kind tie 
that Ashton Kutcher will steal off of George Clooney's neck at the Oscars. That's what we want, pure capitalism. It just so happens that all of our designers and co-owners will be women who have escaped from human trafficking. But they deserve the respect of world-class standards. It occurred to me that in the right time and place, I could buy four girls for the price of that wastebasket. And now I was planning to sell neckties for about the price of a girl. It reminded me of what I taught my students about nonviolence and violence and the price tags we put on each other. Many of you have seen a child crying and an upset parent who says, you want something to cry about? I'll give you something to cry about. Whack. You've probably seen this, something like this. At that moment, the adult isn't seeing the child, not the promise, the pricelessness, all the beauty. At that moment, the child is just a thing that makes noise, that makes you feel ashamed and scared and helpless. And you hit it like a snooze alarm to make it stop making the noise that makes you feel bad. The first step in committing violence is to dehumanize the other, to put a price tag on what is priceless. That's why the first step in nonviolence is to rehumanize each other in our eyes and to rehumanize ourselves in each other's eyes. All these people have been loved and hated. They're as worthy of birth and death and the suffering and joy in between as you and I. They're full of the same fear and desire. There are neighbors on this blue dot, like it or not. Because you see, the enemy is not another gender, another person, another group. The enemy is not another religion or culture or race. It's not greedy rich people or lazy poor people, not another ideology or idiocy, not another way of looking or living or loving. The enemy, the only enemy, we've ever had is violence itself because we are sparks from the same fire. The enemy is violence itself. So what does a hedge fund have to do with all of this? You might be asking. Poverty is the worst form of violence. It's not the can't have or can't give that's worst. It's the humiliation, the price tags we put on each other and ourselves. Can capitalism be a force for nonviolence and not require us to humiliate and exploit others in order to do well? I believe yes, if we change the profit motive. Wealth comes in many forms. In a free market, am I not free to choose how I count my wealth? So I came up with my big dream, the first nonprofit hedge fund. No bonuses for me, no shareholder profits, Total transparency, no lobbyists, shady derivatives, no bailouts. 100% of the profits go to girls living in extreme poverty and violence, to schools, clean water, microloans, and fighting slavery. And to raise capital, instead of looking for a few angel investors, small donations from many people, one dollar or whatever they can spare. No one takes a big risk, and we can all share our little adventure in peacemaking and a new capitalism. There are 1.7 billion people on the internet. I just want a tiny fraction of them. And there's $10 billion in uncirculated change in the US alone. Seriously, check your sofa. <laughs> we are rich in unused resources. In 2008, while I was going to vote, I saw a lot of change signs. And every time I looked down while I was walking, I found change. By the time I had walked less than a mile, I had $1.72 in my hand. I saw a man on the sidewalk. We were both wearing I voted stickers. We both said, we voted, and we high-fived. <laughs> well, it's an accomplishment. Less than half of Americans do it, so it is kind of a thing. He said, Today, I count, and I handed in my fistful of change. Will the Girl Fund project work? I don't know. I just don't know. 
but maybe if we can help a few people go from this to this, some of them will raise their hands and teach us how capitalism can value our values. I know the only failure will be not to try, because it's not about me. I also know that I won't get rich from it if I count riches in money and things. But if I count my riches and smiles on the faces of people who might not otherwise have smiled so much, I'll be very rich indeed. And I know for sure that the guy trying and maybe failing and trying again, along with, I hope, a few million of my closest friends, stands before you today as one of the happier people you'll ever meet. I got my smile back. I found my good fight. And uh, as for that office I still walk past, I no longer flip them the birdcage. Uh, instead, I put my hands together and I say, as I say to all of you now, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.